Peace and love to our PG family and listeners. This is our Sunday School lesson for December the 9th, 2018. This is from our fall quarterly or winter quarterly uh, study. This is lesson two out of unit one. And in our standard lesson commentary, it's entitled Love and Serve God. And in our Faith Pathway study manual, it's entitled Keep Your Promises. Now, our devotional reading is Psalm 81. And then our background scripture is Exodus 20, verses 1 through 11, and then Joshua 24, and then our printed passage is Joshua, the 24th chapter, verses 1 through 3, and then verses 13 through 15, and also verses 21 through 24. And our key verse, reading from the NIV, is Joshua 24, and then verse 15. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served before the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now our lesson's aims are to summarize the portion of today's text regarding Joshua's farewell challenge to the Israelites and their response. Explain what rejecting false gods means in the 21st century. Identify a cultural god and make a plan to resist its influence. Let us begin into the indulgence of our lesson. Now, there is a certain urgency uh, that precedes our lesson. Uh, that is that Joshua is, has grown in age. Uh, J- Joshua was old at the time, and uh, scripture in the 23rd chapter of Joshua says that he was stricken in age. So Joshua realized that he was coming uh, to the end of his time. He realized that uh, he had lived more days than the days that he had remaining. And this urgency of recognizing his time, the situation or the condition of his people and uh, what would be the legacy or what would be the continuation of the people that he had served for such a long time and of how through different periods of time he had seen uh, his people in bondage. He saw them uh, released. He saw what had happened to the enemies of his people. He was there when they were saved and when they were restored on the other side of the parting of the sea. He, he saw their uh, immediate gratitude, but then he also saw them uh, backlash into their old practices. He saw the delay 
of his people in the wilderness as they were just marking time in the wilderness because they were still uh, filled with the ways of another people and another culture. And so he saw the deliverance of his people, but he also saw the entanglement of his people. And now that he realizes that he is about to receive his reward and go home to be with his Lord, he wants to leave an impression. And he was actually responding to the utterance of the Lord speaking to Joshua and through Joshua to Israel. So one of the things we look at in the lesson is is that when Joshua, in verse 1, it says that Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem or Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and they presented themselves before God. And then Joshua said unto all the people, not this is what I want to say, but thus says the Lord God of Israel. And there's some very interesting tidbits of information in here. One is the name of Joshua himself. Now, in the Hebrew alphabet, as has been said before, there was no J. So, actually, the name of Joshua was actually pronounced Yahshua. And the translation, the Hebrew translation of the name Yahshua uh, means the salvation of the Lord or Yahweh brings salvation or that Yahweh saves and depending on which resource of Hebrew translation you use but it's interesting to note that the person the the entity that is being used to be the voice uh, or the mouthpiece to be the mouthpiece to speak unto Israel that person's name actually means that God saves or that salvation is of the Lord and so when we look at the setting here God again is speaking to Israel to give them a word straight from God through God's messenger and leader over his people. And so when we look at this uh, congregation coming together, it's not Joshua giving uh, his last words, but it's actually God speaking through his vessel and his messenger unto his people. And so uh, the commentary has highlighted that this wasn't a political meeting, uh, that this wasn't an uh, economic conference on how Israel could obtain wealth and be financially set uh, for the rest of their being. Um, this wasn't an educational conference. So uh, this wasn't a seminar set up to instruct uh, Israel on how they could acquire uh, higher degrees of learning or how they could access and receive grants and scholarships and, and different funding and stuff so they could further their education. No, this wasn't a political or an educational conference. 
But this here was a spiritual gathering. And as we look at the first verse uh, in our lesson, we realize here that Joshua did not get the opportunity to choose whom he wanted to be at the meeting. So now we can uh, look at this as that Joshua understood the severity of what this meeting and this gathering was for. And therefore, Joshua made certain that all of the different entities, all of the different groups, all of the different organizations, that no one was excluded. Neither did Joshua pick and choose. Joshua didn't say, I like the judges. I want them to be present. But the elders get on my nerves. And then they're always saying, what did you say? I didn't understand that. Can you repeat that? So he didn't get to say, uh, okay, now I want all of the leaders of the different tribes of Israel to be present. But now you don't have to bring your officers. Just the, the leaders can come themselves, the heads of the different groupings of our nation. No, Joshua was not afforded that opportunity or that, uh, uh, that situation. Joshua had to call everybody because what he was about to say affects everybody. There, there is no group that was excluded because there will be no group that will be excluded from the agreement that God is making here with Israel. So by the mere fact that everybody was present, it means that what was said was a agreement and also it was a promise to everybody in the nation. No one was excluded. So in verse 2, it says that Joshua said this to all the people. No one was exempt. Another point that we want to raise, and there are many in this lesson, um, we will not cover them all. Uh, but another one is the location. It was at Shechem. And... If we would refer back to the 12th chapter of uh, Genesis, and I believe it's around about the 7th verse, 6th or 7th, and it talks about how Abram, uh, his name wasn't Abraham yet, but it talks about how Abram was instructed to leave the country of his father and that he was going to move him into another land. And uh, he talked about how that when he transferred Ab Abram to this land that he did not know, that he also was going to multiply Abram's seed. He made this agreement, and uh, scripturally we speak of it as he made a covenant, a contractual agreement with Abram that he was going to make him the father of many nations. And as a respect and out of honor unto God for what God had promised to Abram, he then built an altar, and it was at Shechem. And it's funny that, well, not funny, but, but it is of a uh, solemn observation that God is now his messenger is being, being ready to be called home and he brings the whole nation of Israel back to where the father of the nation established the altar unto God. So 
he now has them at a solemn place where a gesture of respect and honor and reverence was delivered by the father of the nation. And he calls them back to this place. Now, another significance about Shechem, or as I said, Shechem, is that this also, in I believe the 20th chapter of Joshua, this was one of the cities of refuge. So, God is bringing his people together at a place that it has been uh, identified by different purposes. Now, when people would mistakenly or unintentionally kill someone and the avenger from the family of the one who was killed, before the avenger would draw blood from the person who mistakenly or unintentionally killed someone, they could take refuge at Shechem. And they would rest there until they were brought before the consul of Israel. And then judgment would actually be passed upon them. But they could seek refuge from death. They could seek refuge refuge from being killed at a place that was a safeguard until they were properly judged by the council. So as we look at how God is actually administering these words, spiritual utterance to the people of Israel, look at how he set the whole scenario and situation up. He brought them back to a place that had already been a place of familiarity to them for other exercises and activities in the life of the nation. Now, as we look at verses 13 and 14, we recognize here how, first of all, God is through Joshua, is reminding the people that he had brought them into a land. Now, although when they went into the promised land, they did have to battle with the people who were already occupying the land, but the Lord gave them victory over them. But when we look at the provisions that were made, verse 13 tells us about how the land that they possessed, uh, that they didn't have to yield the labor for it, that it says that in a land which ye did not labor, uh, cities which you didn't build, uh, didn't build, and that uh, they were dwelling in the presence of vineyards and olive yards uh, that they didn't plant, that all of these provisions have been uh, provided for them that they came into a conducive area that was suitable for the nation, that God had already made and fulfilled his promise that he was going to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey, signifying that it was going to be a land where they could live in harmony with one another, where it would provide peace and love and respect, and that there would be harmony, that it would be a spiritual renewing. Uh, it would be an area wh which would uh, provide for them not just for the present generation, but for future generations. But in verse 14, there's a uh, wording in it that kind of sets for how these things would be continued. And in verse 14, it says, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, 
and put away the gods of your father served on the other side of the flood. Speaking of the area on the other side of the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. So when we look at this, he's promising to them, look at what I have established for you. Did I not fulfill my promise? Look at the land that I'm bringing you into. All I want you to do is to reverence me. It says, therefore, now fear the Lord. But fear translated means to reverence the Lord. Give unto God the due reverence that God is due. Look at all of what the Lord has done and in return, then what should be our response? Uh, so uh, another uh, good offset of the lesson here uh, to reinforce and reestablish the lesson in your spare time is to read the uh, uh, devotional reading, uh, the number 81 of the Psalms. Uh, and it really puts everything into context. It talks about, it's almost as though the wording in the scripture, you can hear the earnest plea of God saying that, look at everything that I've done for you. Uh, uh, I've, I've brought you into a land that wasn't your own. I, I've provided for you. All I'm asking, I brought you out of uh, servitude. I brought you out of oppression. I brought you out of slavery. I killed your enemies. I drowned them in the Red Sea. Um, uh, if you just look at all of what I've done and all I'm asking for you to do is to hear my voice and to heed my call and to obey the things I have set before you. Not just because the Lord is stuck on the Lord's self, but because the Lord understood that these are the things that inhabit life. But all of those other practices that you picked up from a foreign God and foreign people and somebody else's culture, those are the things that destroy life. And even though you may physically still be alive, you're in your natural form. But spiritually, you are dead and you will reap the consequences of practicing cultural ways and traditions and customs of another people other than the laws that I have set before you. Now, the people respond in urgency. A lot of times when we are in a certain setting and there is a speaker before us and they bring to mind um, the our past, they bring to mind our present, uh, they, they articulate in a fashion that makes everything kind of like just dead front, it's right face to face, uh, there's no denying what is said, uh, we can see ourselves in the different verbiage of what they uh, present to us. We can see that, yes, that was a part of my behavior. Yeah, I, I do that. Yeah, I know that's wrong. No, I, you're right. I shouldn't do that. You, you're correct. I shouldn't talk like that. I shouldn't say that. So uh, once we're in that setting, when we are confined in a congressional, in, in a congregational setting, we are in agreement. And so in verse 21, the people shout in a loud voice and they say, nay, but we will serve the Lord. After what you just finished saying to us, the way you delivered that, all of the stuff you brought up about our past and how, how ashamed we are of that, uh, certainly we will serve the Lord. But now, 
It's just a few years past, and we get into Judges after Joshua, and we find out that those promises that were made in the heat of the delivery from Joshua, that a lot of people went back on their promise. And so when the scripture uh, begins talking about put away those idol gods, those strange gods, um, if we really uh, think about it, sometimes that's equated with we have statues that we bow down to in our homes. Uh, We have rituals uh, that we practice religiously. Uh, And that's who we're giving all of our attention and all of our reverence to. Um, We have uh, certain uh, altars that we are bowing down to, but but they are not set up unto the one true God, the self-created one. Uh, So uh, we think that because we don't have those types of settings, that means we're not worshiping idol gods. But see, one of the aims of the lesson was to talk about the influence of cultural gods. And so we find out that our gods today are not statues. Uh, They're not uh, deities that sit at an altar. But our gods today may be our career choices. Uh, We may have more attention and more reverence to our career than we do to God. Some of us have addictions And uh, some of the addictions appear to be harmless. All addictions don't have to be alcoholic or drug related. But some of us have addictions to lust. Some of us have addictions to sports. Some of us have addictions to fashions. But whatever our addiction or whatever our attraction is that causes us to give more time to it than we do and allocate unto God, that is still idol worship. And as we have said on many occasions, an idol mind is the devil's workshop. If we are not indulging ourselves in constructive, positive, godly, and spiritual manner and practice, then even though I'm not bowing down to a statue, I may very well be still worshiping one. I might just be attached to money and The in God we trust is the last thing that I'm concerned. I'm more concerned about the value of that piece of paper. So we just say that uh, as we look into our lesson, uh, let us do a self-check on how much time are we spending fulfilling the will of God. You know, God recognizes that we live in a very materialistic, high-tech, so-called advanced civilization and society. But God also realizes that if we don't have a spiritual connection to the one who created us, that Even though we have progress and advancement around us, it could very well also be a living hell. So we hope that through our lesson that you, something was said that may have directed you in the right direction. And as always, our prayer is that the blessings of God will continue to be afforded unto those who are the listeners, the hearers, and most certainly the doers of God's word. God bless you.